Well, we are excited to hear from her today. Uh, she is the spokeswoman for the King of Glory. Everybody stand to your feet and let's welcome Pastor Tanisha as she comes to preach. doing all right everyone's looking beautiful springtime is in the air and I'm just happy to be here I just want to give thanks and glory and praise and honor to our wonderful pastor give it up for Pastor Mike who is amazing and so generous with um, the pulpit and you're, um, just an amazing leader um, I just want to hey I have a special shout out Hey, I want you to give it up for my daughter, Jaden. She's over here. She's a part of the Oakland Tech basketball team who won state. Hi, Jaden. She won state this year. Yeah, give her. She's so famous. Yeah, they made history. First time that the Oakland Tech and Oakland High both won state championships. So she's kind of like a part of history, kind of a big deal. Yeah, yeah. All right, y'all ready to get into the word? I really feel God has, he always has a wonderful word for us here. Um, but there is a rhema word in the house, amen. And I do believe there are some things that God wants to speak prophetically, directly into our spirits, amen. If you do need a Bible, look at these beautiful, look at this couple. Look at you, kid. And the, these are goals right here relationship goals, handing out Bibles together. Like, you got to put that on your, I want someone who I could totally hand out Bibles together in church. <laughs> Love you guys. All right. Let's, um, let's just open with a word of prayer. So, God, we come before your presence. We just want to stop and say we love you, God. Can we just take a minute just to worship him? He's an amazing God. Lord, your word is so relevant to our lives. God, we're praying that you will give us revelation, knowledge of who you are today. God, we just want you to be glorified. We just want to see you in a better light. So God, bless your word as it goes forth. God, let it penetrate down into our hearts, deep down into the roots of things. And God, let it bring up life. I come against everything that's not like you. And I pray that you would just... Um, have your way on today. We give you full permission to move however you want to move in this place. God, bless the hearts and the ears. Let it be receptive to your word. And God, let it be life-changing. Let it bring life and liberty to us. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. All right, we're going to get started. Um, I have the, the title. I don't know if they can run the sermon title. Um, the sermon title today is uh, Dramatic Pause. We're going to wait for it. Well, there is a group of us in this room that must be fed by a certain amount of time. Because if you're not fed in a certain amount of time, a transformation will begin to take place <laughs> within our temperament. Today's sermon is Hope for the Hangry. Have you ever been hangry before? And a snicker did not satisfy. Did not, just made you even more mad. Uh, we have a definition, if you're sitting here like, what in the heck is hangry? Uh, we have a definition of hangry. Hangry is the sta a state of anger caused by lack of food. Hunger causing a negative change in an emotional state. How many know this thing is real? It's a real thing. It's not like we're just, you know, imagining this. Okay, good. I'm glad that I'm not the only one in here, and I could do, I'm in a safe place. I feel like I'm in a safe place that I could um, just be my full self in this community. Um, I'm also a self-professed foodie. Is anybody in here like a foodie? Like, I enjoy a good, well-cooked, prepared, with love. Put your foot in, like they used to say, this, y'all don't know that? Okay, I'll just keep on moving. Y'all know put your foot in the thing? That maybe that's just an African-American idiom. Um, but I enjoy a well-cooked meal. And have you, you've been like me. Have you ever been in anticipation of an, of an amazing meal? 
Have you ever been so hungry or hangry and you haven't eaten all day and you're like, you know what, I'm about to sit down and eat. You know, I'm going to go to that restaurant. I heard Yelp reviews. I heard it was great. Okay, I'm going to this restaurant. And you're like really hungry. So you're like, I'm about to, ooh, I'm about to throw down. And you get to the restaurant and, you, you know, you're looking over the menu. And you're like, oh, okay, I see they have shrimp. Oh, shrimp with potatoes. That would be great. Shrimp, potatoes, and a side of asparagus. I'm so hungry. That would be so good. And you built this anticipation for it. And then it shows up. And they come, and it, and it looks like that. Have you ever been in a fancy place like that? And you're like, wait, no, what am I supposed to? Now, that will make you hangry. How many people, if you are super hungry, and they show up with that, how would your godly temperament be at that moment? Well, who would they will see a whole other side of us? Well, just like... That analogy, and I know that might have been a humorous analogy, but there are things, and I feel like the Spirit of the Lord is, is wooing people in here who feel like they're unfulfilled. How many people have held a feeling of, un, I'm just unsatisfied? You've built an anticipation for things in life. You've prepared, you've daydreamed, You've worked hard for that job. You've went to school. You, you took tests and wrote essays for this thing. And then when you get to a place, it's not what you thought it would be. Anybody been there? Unfulfilled. And you're just hungry for more in life. And could it be that we come to a place where we're spiritually hangry, where we're just kind of mad, and irritable, and always on the edge, and always kind of like your, people on your nerves. And maybe it comes from a deeper longing within. Am I alone? Or is there some people who have been in a place where you feel like you just had a longing for more? Like there's a God-sized hole in each of us that can't be filled by things or people, even though we try. We try to put all kind of stuff in there. And it just becomes a vacuum because we need something bigger. And for others, we're going to get real real. You've been in church for a while. You do the church thing. I come every Sunday. I'm trying. But I just still feel empty. You ever felt like, God, God is this it? Like, is this all there is? Because I'm doing all the things. And I still feel like there's a longing inside of me. Like there's got to be more to this. Like I read my Bible, I'm coming to church, I'm singing the songs on the screen. But I, I still feel unfulfilled. I'm still looking for something. I'm still longing for something. Well, the passage that we're going to read today is going to kind of help us in the room who have felt that way. Or is feeling that way even right now. And you're in your seat and you're like, that is me. The passage that we're going to dive in today is Isaiah 55. And it's a passage from our Lent, our season of Lent. But it's such a great passage because it was meant to come to a group of people who had been exiled by God. I mean, Pastor Ben was here a couple of Sundays ago, and he talked about the cycle. Like, you, you worship God, you leave God. And then you, put, you get in an exile, you get on a timeout, a spiritual timeout, and then God brings you back. Well, these people have been exiled for a while, and they felt like God was done with them. Like, they were an afterthought. They, you know what, I've messed up so bad that God is done with There's no way he would want me back. I, I did the most this time. Like, I really left him. This is the group of people who this passage was written to, a bunch of people who thought God had forgotten about them. Have you ever been there? Have you been in a place where you just been like, you know what, I asked God for one more chance, and he gave me 30 more, and I still messed up, and I still keep doing the things, and there's no way that he's looking at me with an eye of love like that. the people who he is talking to, a group who was exiled. They were banished away from their homes, banished away from everything they love, they love. And sometimes our hearts can feel far from God. 
far from home. God is a place that feels like home, and sometimes we feel far from it. So let's dive into this. Let's look at what he's, what he's saying. Can you guys read that pretty good? All right. Isaiah 55. It says, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure love for David. Then we're going to skip down to verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the, for, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than yours. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Isn't that an amazing scripture? You know, a lot of times we try to put God, make him human like us. And he's trying to tell you, no, no, boo, that's not how this works. My thoughts are way higher than yours. And my ways are even more, we're trying to make God make sense to us. We serve in a, a, a mighty God. Now, this, in this passage, God gives us a great invitation. This is what it's called. He's speaking to all those people who thought God was done with them. All the people who were slaves at the time. All the people who had nothing to offer God. And he says, come, buy, eat. And be satisfied. So let's deal with this misconception about God. Because sometimes we think that even when we messed up, that God doesn't want to have nothing to do with us. That he's ashamed of us. That every time he sees us, he has this look of disappointment. Like, look at them. Look at them. To, to always messing up. Look at That's how we perceive God. This verse tells us otherwise. This is an inviting God. This is a God who is saying with multiple times in this passage, hey, come. In the, in the King James, it starts off with, ho, oh, everyone who's thirsty. So he's like, hey, over here, come. Like he's like bidding you to come to him. Look at this inviting God. I want you to change and shift your paradigm from where you think God, when he, you think he's looking at you with disappointment, I have good news for you. He's inviting you. He's like, hey, come. No, over here. Over here. I need you over here. Now let's check out who is he inviting. We could go back to Isaiah. Yep, yeah, let's go back to um, Isaiah 55, the verse uh, 1. Who is he inviting? First of all, he's inviting the thirsty. Yep, come. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. First person he's inviting are the thirsty. Those who are thirsty, those who are dry. Have you ever been in a dry season where nothing satisfies? Like you just feel parched. Have you ever been like in a really hot day? Maybe you're exercising or sweating. Like what really quenches your thirst? If you're like really working out and somebody hands you a warm glass of milk, what would that do for you in that moment? What would it do for you? It would do absolutely nothing. That won't quench the thirst that's going on. That's kind of how life is. We're doing all these things, and we just keep trying to get things to quench it, and we got the, all the wrong stuff. And sometimes we're just bored. Sometimes you just want something so bad that you can taste it, but it's always out of reach. He's calling for 
the thirsty. Have you ever been thirsty for something? Have you ever been longing for something? Well, guess what? This is the people he's calling. If you've ever felt that, have you ever felt something so close but you can't get it? The thirsty. First person he's calling is the thirsty. The second people he's calling is the broke. He wants the thirsty and the broke. And that's usually the people we, and we kind of be like capping on on social media. Like, Ooh, they heck of thirsty. No, actually, that's the, that's the person God wants. Check it out. He says, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come buy, eat. Now, I had to think about this for a little while because I'm like, well, Lord, if I don't have no money, if you telling me if I don't have no money, but you just said, come buy and eat. But I ain't got no money because I'm, I'm broke. I'm thirsty and I'm broke. But this is the thing. He catches you. He comes, he comes to you and says, come and buy. You don't have money, but let me tell you, what I'm offering you is not cheap. Even though it's free, it costs something. Your salvation is not cheap. It's free to you, but it did cost something. Anybody familiar with the phrase, there are no free lunches? Because something had to give his life to that for to have that lunch. Even though you getting it for free, that cow had that hamburger had to go. And that, that cow had to, even if you're a vegan or a vegetarian, that little plant had to get killed for you. Right? There's no free, like that plant was alive. Now it's dead, and you eating it. <laughs> so why is he trying to say, even if you don't have money to come and buy, yes. what God is offering is, is free, but it's not cheap. Yes. It's not cheap. This is the perfect definition of grace. Look at what God is extending to you. We don't have enough. You don't have enough resources. There's nothing you can do to earn or deserve it. But he's saying, still, come. Come by. It's not, it's, not, it's not cheap. It's expensive. But come and, come and buy. Come and buy. Come and get these things. All right. Then the third person he's talking to, we got the thirsty. We got the broke. I should ask y'all to raise your hand for each one, but I'm not going to do that. How many are thirsty? How many are broke? The third one, it says, um, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? He's talking to those who have resources but are using it to find fulfillment in the, all the wrong things. He says, okay, okay, we got the thirsty, we got the broke out the way. And then we got people who got it, people out there balling. You have resources. You have things to make your life comfortable and complete. But yet that longing that is still on the inside, you're still trying to complete it with things. Maybe if I just have more, if I just have the look, the image, a new person, a new significant other, I knew I'll just keep changing all these things out until I'm really got what I want, but there's still a Grand Canyon-sized hole in your heart that you cannot feel. He says, why do you spend money? You know, God is perplexed at what we spend on our habits and our addictions. He's perplexed at it. He asked a question like, why, why are you spending money? He is so perplexed. Like, are you serious? Why are you spending your hard-earned money on things that can't satisfy you? Think about this. Think about everything you turn to when you have that longing inside of you that you spend money on. For me, it was Starbucks. I've been delivered this month. <laughs> Starbucks going to run you about 4 50 for, for, for a tall. <laughs> now think of all the times I've spent money because I need a coffee to be nice to people. Like, Lord, let me get my coffee so I can deal with these folks. <laughs> or let me get coffee so I can just have a good personality. Now think about your, whatever you turn to, to fill a longing in your heart, to make you feel like you can function or go on through the day. And think about how much money you would have in the bank. Come on, can I be real? Can we be real today? 
Think about all the money you would have in the bank. When God is saying everything you're spending money on, I could give it to you for free. You looking, you looking for, you looking for fulfillment. You looking for something to take your mind off things. You looking for something to numb that's what's going on on the inside. You looking for love. You looking for hope. You looking for a little touch. You want to just take a vacation. You want all that. God is like, I could give it to you for free. It's all in my presence. I could give it all to you, but why do? You, why would you spend your money? He actually, he has a very good question. Why are you, why are you spending your money on stuff? Why are you spending your time and your resources? He even says, um, uh, and why do you labor for that which was what would satisfy? That means you got it and you got the physical ability, but you're working hard to do all the wrong things because you're trying to feel something on the inside. Come on, we're going we gonna to get free today. We're going to get free today. So what is he offering we could go to the, the highlighted ones. What is he offering? He's like, like we, we understand. Okay, we thirsty, we broke, we spending all our money, Jesus. Well, we, okay, I got it. But what is he offering to us? This is so great because he is offering four different things, four different things that are spiritual sustenances afforded to only those who live in fellowship with God. Now, these are the things you really need to satisfy you. What, what we got? We got water, we got wine, we got milk, and we have bread. These are all symbolic. These are all symbolic. Walk with me. Water. We first see this. Well, we don't first see it, but we see Jesus talk about this in the New Testament. Remember when he was talking with the woman at the well? Remember that great story? And he says to her, everyone who drinks this water, natural water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give them, the water that I give will never be thirsty again. The water I give will become a well of water springing up into eternal life. We're talking about living water. So this is my question. If we belong to God, we are people of God, why are we still thirsty? Jesus promised, if you get this water, you'll never thirst again. we like, whoo, never thirst. That's what the lady of the well, she's like, good, I don't have to come to this well no more. He's like, nope, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about spiritual water. But why are we so dry and thirsty? I'm just, I'm just asking questions. You know, we're, we're pitching Christianity. We're telling our friends, like, oh, yeah, I found Jesus is great. But our lives are just as dry as. What, what is it about our lives that are different than other people who are going, that we're working with or that we're seeing every day? We're just as parched and dry. Why is that? When Jesus is offering us this living water springing up into eternal life. Let's see, what else is he offering? He's offering wine. Now, these are things, they remember, they're slaves. These are delicacies that they would not have been afforded otherwise. Can you imagine being in, in poverty? Remember how the slaves were in poverty and we had to eat the leftovers of everything? That's where chitlins came from. That's where hog head cheese comes from. That's where pig's feet comes from because we had to eat the last of everything. So for these slaves, they're like, what? Wine? Bread? We don't, get, we don't get none of that. We get scraps. What does this wine represent? All time in the, in the Bible, wine always represents joy. And it always represents the Holy Spirit. It's the new wine that he's offering. That new, remember when the book of Acts and when they, the, they received the Holy Spirit, they're like, why are these people drunk? They're like, no, they're not drunk as you suppose. This is the Holy Spirit. So he's offering living water, he's offering wine, which is joy, which brings joy. Now, I don't leave here talking about that. They said we could have wine and y'all be out doing too much. The Bible says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. So it's a symbol, people, it's symbolic. Don't go out doing too much, saying Pastor Nisha said, the Holy Spirit said we could have wine. I digress. So do you need joy? Is that what you're laughing, lacking? Well, sometimes, you know, depression is a real thing, and it's very, it's chemical related, and sometimes it could be spiritually related also. It's, it's both. But can, have we even tried 
this new wine, this joy? Have you ever had joy that makes no sense? Like when you're going through things and people are like, there's no way. How do you understand what you're going through? And you're like, I don't know. I, I don't even understand it. I just, there's something happening in me. I don't know. This is the joy that he wants to give you. So we got the water. We got the wine. We have milk. He says, um, First Peter says, like newborn infants long for the spiritual pure milk that you may grow up into salvation, if you indeed have tasted that the Lord is good. I love that verse. If you've tasted that the Lord is good, then you need this milk. Now, if a ba newborn baby, we have some beautiful babies here. If we just gave them water and be like, hey, kid, there you go. Grow, go ahead and grow up and live, right? Water won't do it. You need milk. Milk gives you the sustenance that you need. Same thing spiritually. He's offering you something of substance, yes. something that will stick to your bones, something that you need to grow as an infant. Now, this is the point that we get. Most of us have been born again, but we have not grown up into our faith. We're still spiritual babies. We're still kind of just toddling along when God wants us to grow up into our faith. Amen? Yes. Amen? So we got water. We got wine, we got milk, and of course we got bread because Jesus said what? I am the bread of life in John 6. He is the bread. He's the thing that gives us something. Are y'all with me? Y'all feeling me? Y'all good? Okay, so all this is great. So then how do we find spiritual satisfaction? How do we give them, like, thank you for the bread and the wine analogies, that's cool, but I'm still feeling this thing on the inside of me. How do you find fulfillment? How do you quench this longing that just nags at you when you try to go to sleep at night? How do you, how do you stop comparing yourself to where your peers are and really be complete of where God has put you at at this present time? How? Well, if we look closely at this scriptures, it'll tell us how, because the first, the first principle, we have two principles I want you to leave here with, of how to find true satisfaction, all right? The first one is that you have to have a perpetual and a continual refilling, all right? You got it? A perpetual and a continual refilling. No one eats one meal for life and is satisfied. Matter of fact, a lot of you guys will leave here and you'll go to brunch, and then by about 8 o'clock at night, you'll be like, oh, what we got in there to eat? Like, even if the meal was great, have you had, like, the best meal ever? And then you wake up the next morning and be like, okay, well, what's for breakfast now? No one eats one time and is filled for life. Now think about that, spiritually. No one can eat one time and be set for life. Yet we do God like that. Hey, I went to church. I walked down the aisle, gave my life to God. Yep, I'm set, good for life. That's, that's about it. That's what I did. And we never really go back to it. We never come back and eat. We never come back and partake of it. If you're going to be satisfied in this life, it's perpetual. It's continual. You have to continue to buy. You have to continue to eat. You have to continue to drink. I'm trying to help you out here. It's a continual process. You have to get this into your spirit. It's not a one-time thing. You have to continue to eat and partake. And, and it's just like... Um, uh, when, you, when you're, when you're, uh, I, won't, I won't say that one. I won't say that. I'm going to leave that one for later. All right. Second thing you have to do if you're going to be truly satisfied is that you have to be intentional in your relationship with God. Think about it. Anything you want in life, you have to be intentional about. If you're in a relationship, you need to be intentional with the person. You know, you need to call them sometimes, perhaps. Answer a call. You know, maybe go out. That's intentional. If you're trying to get fit and you're going to the gym, you actually need to go to the gym and not have a membership card that hangs on your keychain forever, like me. Um, 
anything you want in life, you actually have to be intentional about. Amen? So we understand this, this, this principle. When you go to the gas, you can, you can have a brand new Maserati outside. If you don't put no gas in it, it's just going to just kind of be sitting there looking cute. You have to refill. Yes. You have to come drink. You have to, and you have to be intentional with your relationship with God. Now, this is the missing key because this is why we walk around saying, I'm just so lonely and unfulfilled and I don't know what's going on. But have we actually put time and and effort into our relationship with God? Now, I'm not talking about works. You do not have to work for your salvation. Salvation is free. Salvation is free, but you have to put work into your relationship with God for it to be successful. All right? So how does an intentional relationship with God, what does it look like? What does it look like? We'll go back to the next slide. What does it look like? God has some, some directives that you would just pay attention to. Pay attention to these directives that God has. And if you're looking to be filled, if you're looking to be satisfied, if you're looking for fulfillment, I promise you, it's everything is found in these verses. This is what an intentional relationship looks like. The first one, it says, listen diligently. Listen diligently. There's a difference between listening and then listening diligently. You ever lost your car keys? You're not just like, you know, you know I wonder where it's at. No, you're tearing up the house because you got somewhere to go. You're turning over pillows and just emptying stuff out. That's what diligently looks like. When is the last time we've diligently listened? That means you're very intentional. We got a lot of stuff going on on our radio. We got a lot of stuff going on on Netflix. We got a lot of stuff that we're listening to. But what was the last time we've listened diligently? What does that look like? To really sit and be like, God, I got to hear from you. The last decision, the next decision, do you make time to say, you know what? I'm not making a move until I hear from God. And I was being like, I don't know what this guy sound like. I don't know. Well, if you just get in your word, if you have some quiet space, if you just meditate, if you get in God's presence, I promise you God's not lacking in talking. He's, he's, he's always talking. It's us. We need to be in a place where we can be still and diligently listen. And then look at the next one. He says, eat. Eat and delight. Look at these wonderful adjectives. Now, it's not enough just to come here and hear this message and be like, oh, that was really great. Okay, great. No, but what is it? just like if I had a beautiful meal here, you wouldn't be like, that meal looks amazing. I've, I'm sure it's good. It wouldn't count unless you eat it and you taste it. You can't grow in your faith, just like a baby would not be able to grow unless they actually drunk the milk. That's why the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. We all know what it's like to be like, oh, I don't like a certain thing, and then someone cooks it really good. You're like, oh, I didn't even know I liked this. You actually have to taste it. You have to eat. And God says, if you eat what is good and delight in yourself. And this is the part where I'm always like perplexed and I've been there before. You're like, oh yeah, I have to pray. Oh, I, I better do, I better read because you know, I, they, they said this is what I have to do. And it's kind of like a burden like, oh, okay, time to go to church. Let's really, we gotta, but this is different. This is saying delight yourselves. To make, to, to really get your joy from it is a whole different thing than having to. It's not like I get to. It's not like I have to. You get to do it. It's an amazing thing when you delight yourself in God. God will put something inside of you where you'll be like, you know what? I want to do this. No, I'm happy to go to church. I can't wait to get up and hear what God's going to say to me. I can't wait to be in worship. There's a difference when you delight. And it says, delight yourself in rich food. God is always lavishing himself on us. He's always offering. He's never scared. He doesn't operate in scarcity like we think he does. 
He's not giving us crumbs. He doesn't like barely have it. Notice there's not even a timetable on here. He doesn't say you got one week to come and eat this feast and then it's over. There's no, scarce, no scarcity in God. There's no timetable to this. Come, eat rich food, good stuff. Get, leave all that junk food alone that you partaking in. You ever didn't remember your mom always said, stop eating all them cupcakes before dinner because it's going what? Well, y'all, somebody listen to their mama. Good job. Take that same principle spiritually. We're putting so much stuff, so much junk, so much, and they're not bad in themselves, but if you eat too much of something, it's, you know, so we have to balance that thing. Rich food God is offering us. Okay, let's keep going. I'm just, um, look at how many times he's emphasizing hearing. First he says, listen diligently. Then he says, incline your ear. Then under that it says, hear. God's trying to tell us something, you think? Yeah. Something's important here. Yeah. Something's very important if you're trying to have, find fulfillment and find a longing in him. He's saying you got to listen. Yeah. Stop talking so much. Yeah. <laughs> I gave you two, two ears and one mouth. Yeah. Listen to me. Yeah, it's just like when you're a little kid, they just doing nothing. No, stop. Listen to me. Get these instructions. I'm trying to give you things that will cause your soul to live. You want your soul to live? Aren't you tired of being dry and parched and longing and unfulfilled? God has given us everything we need here. Come to me. Listen to that beautiful invitation. He says, come. Can you imagine God standing with his arms out wide? So this is not the picture that we have of God. We think he has a, a frown on his face. But he has his arms wide open like, come on. Come to me. I have what you need to fulfill that longing inside. And these are the last things that make our, our, our walk with God intentional. First, we have to seek the Lord while he may be found. Seek is an action word. It's not casual. You're actually going after God. Like going after God like hard. When was the last time you've gone after God in a way that wasn't casual? I'm just kind of, yeah, I'm here, and you know, if God's going to do it, he's going to do it, and if he's not, then oh well. No, God wants us to go after him. And when we seek him, while he may be found is while you're in the land of the living, while you're alive, while you're alive, you are alive for a purpose. Your life is not to be wasted seeking all these other things. You are to be seeking God with the breath that he's given you right now. Tomorrow's not right. We have so many things happening in our headlines and our news, personal tragedies. Life is not guaranteed. Please hear me. So you need to seek God while he may be found, while you're in the land of the living. And the last thing he says is to but let the wicked forsake his way. Let the wicked forsake, to turn and forsake his way. And a beautiful part it says at the end is to return. Return. It says, um, let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God who will abundantly pardon. Come on, y'all got to hear me on this. This is the God that we're serving. He's not mad at you. Somebody needs to hear that in here. God's not mad at you. He's not holding the past against you. All he wants is for you to come, return, forsake, Leave those things, all that stuff you trying to fixate it on, leave that alone. Let me give you the real things that will satisfy your soul and will give you complete fulfillment and nourishment. Leave those things alone. And something amazing will happen when you become intentional with God. You, you get out of your spiritual life what you put into it. If you don't leave with anything else, I want you to know that. 
You get out of your spiritual life what you're put into it. So if you're feeling dry and you're feeling parched and you're feeling a little like nothing's going on in here, I would encourage you to put something, some intentionality into your spiritual life. And when you have an intentional relationship with God, something amazing begins to happen. Your appetite begins to change. You ever experienced that? You ever go like oh, when we do our, our Daniel fasts and stuff and you go without meats and sweets and then all of a sudden you don't have a taste for those things anymore? Yeah. You're like, oh, I don't even need no M&Ms. I didn't even, didn't even know that. Your appetite changes. We're going to end with, with this verse, um, Psalms 63. This is also a, a lectionary passage. Something amazing will happen. God will begin to change your appetite. And David wrote this psalm when he went, he was in the wilderness of Judah. He was in a dry place. And I want you to know that you will go through dry places. Life will happen. Things happen. People change. You will go through dry times. You will go through deserts. But look at David's response when he got into a dry place. He says, God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hand. Sounds a lot like church. My soul will be satisfied. Y'all hear that? My soul will be satisfied with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. Friends, only God can satisfy. I can save you years of time right here. Only he can satisfy. And something happens when you become intentional in your relationship with God. You, your longings that you long for all these other things, will start. you'll start longing for him. It's the most beautiful thing that could ever happen. That your soul will start longing for him instead of turning to all the things that you turned to in the past. Instead of turning to all the things that you, you used to turn to to numb you, to make you happy. You need something to make you happy. You need something to bring you down. You need something to mellow you out. God say, let me be that person for you. Let, I want you to long for me. And as we turn towards the cross, because we are in Lent season, as we turn our eyes toward the cross, the, the good news to all of this is that Jesus is the fulfillment of everything we've just talked about. He is the complete, when he died on the cross, he unlocked the way for all of us to enjoy a fulfilled life. Remember the Isaiah passage was talking to exiled slaves. Now Jesus says in John 7, 37, and this is our last scripture, look what Jesus cries out. On the last day of the feast, and this was like the big party in Jerusalem. This was the thing where they had plenty of food, plenty of wine, plenty of things, and people were still leaving leaving empty. And Jesus stood up and said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, or as the old folks used to say, out of his belly, shall flow rivers of living water. Now, this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in were to receive for as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus had not been glorified. If you are here and you're living in a feeling of never being satisfied and never being uh, uh, long, having your longings fulfilled, Jesus is crying out today and he is saying, Anyone who thirsts, anyone who is unfulfilled, come to me, and I will give you living water. I will give you water. And he said this of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And this is why we need to ask 
to be filled with the Holy Spirit every day. You all can stand, right? To be filled with the Holy Spirit every day is so important, just like you need to fill your car up with gas every day. Just as you need to eat food and sustain yourself every day. This is how much we need the Holy Spirit. Our question today is, what do you usually turn to when you're spiritually hangry? What is your go-to? This is some reflective work you could do within yourself. Let's just take a minute to think about this. When you're feeling empty, when you're feeling dissatisfied and mad because things aren't going your way, what is the thing you turn to first? Whatever that thing is, God is saying, I want to be that thing. I want you to practice coming to me, being intentional with me, and watch me change your desires. Watch me change your longings. It says, what steps will you take to be more intentional with your relationship with God? I want you to think about that right now. Because coming to church is cool. I mean, it's, it's good for a couple of hours. But we spend a lot more time away from this place than we do here. So how will you sustain yourself? Pastor can't be with us 24-7. This is time for us to grow in our own relationships with God. Last question is, what would it look, what would it look like in your life to never be spiritually hungry or thirsty again? Can you just close your eyes? I want you to imagine what would it look like to never be spiritually hungry or thirsty again? What would your life look like? How would your temperament change? How would you treat people? I have good news for you. Jesus offered this water and this bread. You never have to thirst again spiritually. You never have to be longing for things because everything you need has already been provided for by Jesus. All he needs is intentionality with him and he will give you everything you need in your soul. Your soul will eat rich food. Well, let's just take a time just to, just to pray. If you're here and you're tired of being dissatisfied and unfulfilled, I just want you to do take some time with God and say, you know what, Lord? I surrender. I want to surrender my will for your will. God, I want more of you. And I'm saying I want to be more intentional with my relationship with you today. Now we have all, everyone self-reflecting. But if you're here and you're like, I don't even know this God. I want to know him for myself. Then this time is for you. You could just make up in your mind and say, you know what? I want to follow this God. If he can offer, this is mind-blowing. This is almost too good to be true. That a God will give me something for free, and all I have to do is decide to follow him. So can we just lift up our hands and let this be your sign of surrender? To say, God, I want more of you. Come on, ask God, let God fill me with your Holy Spirit. I need more. I need a perpetual and a continual refilling. You've done it all. He's already laid out the banquet. All you have to do is come and eat. Come and partake. Everything's laid out for you. Now, will you, as you lift your hands, will that be your surrender to say, God, I'm coming? Someone might need to say, God, I need to return. God, I need to eat. I need to actually eat of you. I need to need to be more intentional with you 
and watch God feel every longing in your heart. Watch him do it. Watch him change your appetites. If you're here and you're like, I need my appetites changed. I have habits in my life. I'm turning to things that are not good for me. Come on, just throw your hand in the air. We're all worshiping. No one's singling you out. But I need you to give that addiction to God. I need you to say, God, you know why I'm turning to these things. I'm trying to numb it. I'm trying to forget. I'm trying to find comfort. But I want to turn to you. You are in this room today. And this is God saying, come. I know all about it. And I want you. I want to give you my rich food. I want to give you real bread. I want to give you real wine. I want to give you joy. I want to give you real water. I want to satisfy that thirsty, longing, parched place in your soul. And only he can do it. Only he can do it. Nothing else satisfies. Nothing else satisfies. Please hear me, friends. There's nothing else that will satisfy the longing of your soul except Jesus. So, God, we lift our hands to you today. And we acknowledge that you are the source of life. And you have given us a wonderful invitation to come and eat for free. When you died, it cost a lot. But all we have to do is come and eat for free. The grace you pray, poured out on us is amazing. It's mind-blowing. It's too good to be true. But we accept it and we say, God, feel every longing in our souls. Because it's really pointing to how much we need you. Hear me. That thing you want so bad is pointing to the fact that we really need him. So, God, I pray a blessing over this congregation. God, we want more of you. And thank you that you never run out. You're not a God of scarcity, but you have rich and lavishness for us in our souls.